Hi folks, thank you for uh, coming. Uh, so we have an excellent guest speaker in Dr. Uh, Harvard Lee today. And guys, you can set it up and get started. So uh, Harvard is, uh, you know, he's a homecoming fan. He's a Stanford yes. graduate. Yes. And uh, right now he's the founder and CTO of. Uh, Time corporation that you uh, hear from, and uh, before that, uh, his background has uh, spanned quite a lot of fields. He was in nanotech, uh, condensed matter physics, semiconductor physics, material science, and uh, previous to Stein, he was uh, CTO and founder of uh, another material startup, Ultra Photonics. Yes. Right. And before that, he was uh, on the other side of the bay working for uh, Lawrence uh, Livermore. Lawrence Livermore Lab. Yes. And he did his uh, PhD in chemistry from uh, Stanford and before that, bachelor's from Harvard Mechanics. That's correct. Thank you. Glad to have you here. Great. Thank you. So, uh, I'd like to first thank uh, Anish for inviting me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be back at Stanford again. Um, as I mentioned, I used to walk these halls as well. I got my PhD under Michael Fair in the chemistry department. In fact, it was a long time ago, probably predates nearly all of you here. Um, our lab used to be in the basement of the old chemistry building, and that was after the, uh, the 1906 earthquake, not before. So it was a long time ago, nevertheless, I think, um, but it's still good to be back here at Stanford. So I'd just start by first giving you a brief history and background of Stein Corporation. As I mentioned, I'm the CTO and founder of Stein, and Stein was founded in 2006, in June of 2006. We are a thin film module manufacturer, which means that over the last few years, it's been very interesting times for us because of what's been happening in the, in the marketplace. But our goal at Stein is to manufacture very high efficiency thin film modules so that we can enable the lowest installed system cost. Okay, that's really important. Because if you are a customer, all you really care about is the installed system cost. And you care less about whether the module costs 50 cents a watt or 20 cents a watt or it's free. Right? And this becomes even more important to consider the fact that over the last few years, the fraction of the total and system cost that's attributable to the module cost has dropped significantly. Right? This is important. And so as a result of that, um, in fact, just to give you an idea how much this has dropped, a few years ago, the module contributed about over 50% of the cost of the system. Now it's down to about 30% or less, and that number will only decrease. So therefore, as a module manufacturer, which is what we are, the most effective way to make an impact on the total system cost, by total system I mean, of course, the PV system, because you're not, gonna, you're not buying a module, you're buying a whole PV system. And so as a module manufacturer, the best way to make an impact is by increasing their efficiency. That's a very important concept. In fact, I would say that if you're a module manufacturer and, you're not, and you do not have a roadmap to get to 18, 20, and beyond efficiency, then life will become very difficult for you in the coming years. You must have that technology. So in recognition of that, Stein has identified or has defined four generations of technology to get to very high efficiencies, where each generation of technology represents a revolutionary change and a big increase in efficiency from the previous generation. Now, that's unique in the solar industry to have four generations of technologies to find. But I also like to point out that Stein is unique in another way. If you look at the solar industry, nearly all manufacturers tie their technology to a single material system. And their technology roadmap consists of tweaking that system and or their device structures to increase the efficiency. So for example, if I asked you, if I say uh, first solar, what do you think of? You can think of Cat Telluride. If I say solar frontier, what do you think of? You think of SIGs, right? Uh, if I mentioned uh, nano solar or uh, solar power, you think of SIGs. Now here's the important one. If I say Stion, what do you think of? That's what I thought. Okay, it's because you know we've been trying to stay under the radar, but for people who know about Stion, they think we are a SIGS company. 
and for a good reason, because our first generation technology is a single junction six. But that perception would be incorrect. We are not a six company. It turns out that we are materials agnostic. We use whatever material it takes to get to high efficiencies because of what we just talked about. High efficiency is everything. Okay? So we are materials agnostic. In fact, to give you an idea, um, when we were fundraising, I used to tell potential investors that the same thing. I would say we would use whatever material it takes to get to high efficiency. And to make the point, I would tell them that we would even use cow dung if it works. Now, of course, it's not a great thing to tell potential investors that you can use cow poop to make this thing work. But that's the point I want to get across. So in essence, this is what Stein's about. Not, not cow dung, but it's about generating very high efficiencies to enable the lowest installed system cost. I, I took a lot of time to mention that because it's a very important point moving forward in the industry. And people are just starting to recognize that. So that's the introduction for uh, what I'd like to say. Um, in the next slide, I'm attempting to summarize the PV technologies in one slide. So if you look at this, if you look at this very carefully, what I've done is I've plotted the efficiency as a function of the production cost. And of course, the ideal PV technology has, is a right combination or right balance of high efficiency and low cost. And of course, in this case, the efficiency is, is scaled increasingly in this direction, and the production cost decreases in this direction. So the quadrant in which you want to be at is right here. This is where the efficiency is high and the cost is low. And you notice that it's actually, without Stein being there, it's actually a hole in the marketplace from, from a technology perspective. So if you look at this very carefully, there's actually classes of materials that exist in this plot. All of the wafer-based materials exist in this quadrant where it's very high efficiency and high cost. All the thin films generally tend to be in this region where the costs are very low, but the efficiencies are also low. So in many ways, this title here being the having silicon efficiencies at, very, at thin film cost is really the ideal for now because it has the right balance of efficiency and cost. Now, um, going forward, I would like point out amorphous silicon. Amorphous silicon is really bizarre to me because of the following reason. Uh, in spite of the Ronsky stabler effects, amorphous silicon should have died out a long time ago. And I hope I'm not insulting anyone in the audience for saying that. But amorphous silicon is really a bizarre thing. But even at a triple junction level, the efficiency barely cracks double digit efficiency. So it's a bit of a problem that it lasted that long. But if you look at thin films, which is what I'm talking about today, most of them are in this region here. Cat Telluride First Solar is the king of thin films for good reason. They do manufacturing very well, and they do everything very well. Unfortunately, Cat Telluride, First Solar in particular, their efficiency is about 11%, uh, which is very low. Okay. However, I should point out that very recently, they announced a breakthrough in the laboratory in which they got up to about 17%, I believe. And so we expect First Solar to move into this quadrant very, very soon. On the other hand, if you look at Stion, which many of you have not heard about, clearly, and that's all right, um, our Gen 1 device is a SIGS single junction device, and it's just barely cracking into that first quadrant, uh, this quadrant right here. It's at 12 to 14 percent, but our Gen 2 happens to be a tandem, which I'll talk about in greater detail, and that's at 18 to 22 percent. That is a thin film result, and that's clearly within this region, and it clearly competes in efficiency with crystalline silicon, and but it is at a much lower cost. Okay. So having said that, I'd like not to introduce you to the four generations of technology that Stein has defined uh, for a company. Here I've plotted the efficiency as a function of year. As I mentioned, Stein was started in 2006. And each of these lines represent a generation of technology uh, for Stein. This is the Gen 1 technology. This is the Gen 2 technology, which is a tandem. And this is the Gen 3. Gen 1 is a single junction SIGS and is currently in production in our facility in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. If you're interested in why we moved to Hattiesburg, come talk to me later. There's a, a lot of um, interesting uh, anecdotes behind that. But nevertheless, it is currently in production. You can see that it is very efficient. This um, efficiency range represents the typical thin film single junction efficiency. This represents the typical silicon single junction efficiency. So you see that even for a single junction device, thin films, we are competitive, at least with the lower efficiency silicon. Our second generation technology, the tandem, clearly exceeds that and will even grow even better. 
A third generation is meant to be at 25%, and the fourth generation is intended to crack 30. Keep in mind that what I'm talking about here is unconcentrated um, PV efficiencies in which the panel size is a square meter. So it's not limited by the size of the bull that you can grow because it's thin film. This is meant to be a full-size panel that you can put on your rooftop and for utilities, anything of that kind, non-concentrated. Okay. So let me move on and talk about tandems and multi-junction devices. Okay. Now, first I'd like to comment on high-efficiency PV devices. So please um, let me know if, you, if I'm saying anything that's, that you don't understand here. But the important point here is that the highest efficiency is achieved only when the photon is absorbed at the band edge. And you can see this in this diagram here. This is the conduction band, this is the valence band. If the photon is absorbed above the band edge, then hot carriers are generated in both bands. These hot carriers then undergo very rapid, non-radiative, intra-band relaxation to the band edge, from here to here and from here to here. That's because of the very strong electron-phonon interactions that occur involving acoustic, optic, and in some cases, localized phonon states as well. But the important point is that that non radio relaxation is very fast, so fast that it, occur it occurs on the order of picoseconds to hundreds of femtoseconds. And it's so fast that it relaxes down, all of the hot carriers relax down before you can extract the carriers from the conduction band or the valence band. Therefore, you lose all of this excess energy above the bandage as heat and the efficiency drops. And in fact, it drops significantly, depending on how far above the bandage that you are. On the other hand, if you are looking at bandage excitation, as indicated right here, clearly there's no intraband relaxation occur, no heat is generated, and the efficiency remains high. So the important point here is really that if your light source is monochromatic, then the best efficiency achieved by an absorber in which the band gap matches the photon energy. On the other hand, if your light source is a series of discrete states, let's say of n discrete uh, photons, then the best absorber you can get would be n absorbers in which the band gaps match photon energies. Now, if you look at sunlight, it's horrible. Why? Because it is polychromatic over a very broad spectral range. That is the hardest thing to do. So what do you do in this case? The best thing you can do right now is to use make n as large as possible that is commercially practical. Ideally, n would be infinity, in which case you'd lose nothing. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. But that's not very practical. And besides that, it's a proper balance between efficiency and commercialization. With higher n, a lot of unfortunate things happen. The costs increase, the manufacturing complexities increase dramatically, and the reliability decreases. So from our perspective, the best compromise occurs when n is equal to two or three, basically a tandem or a triple junction device. And that's because the differential efficiency gain from higher order multi-junction devices do not justify commercially getting there. That's a very important point. This is real life. Things are never perfect. This is how it is. Right? So if you look at now, the efficiencies possible with multi-junction devices. This is a plot I've taken from another person's plot, so I, um, I, I can't remember who it was, but nevertheless. This is a plot of the detailed balance efficiency. It's a function of the number of junctions or the number of absorbers that you have. And in this, you see two plots. One is one sun excitation, and the other one is maximum solar concentration. Let me focus on the one sun. And this, is, uh, this represents a table of the efficiencies for one, two, and three absorbers and infinite number of absorbers. Right? So if you look at the one sun excitation, if you look at one absorber, you see the shockley quiser limit here at 31% efficiency. That's what it should be. As you increase the number of junctions, the number of absorbers, clearly the efficiency increases because you're, you're absorbing more sunlight more effectively. But if you look at this very carefully, the slope of the tangent to this line decreases as you increase the number of junctions. It's basically sublinear in this case. What that means is that the differential increase in efficiency decreases as you increase the number of junctions. But what's more importantly is that the differential increase in the cost and complexity increases dramatically as you increase the number of junctions. So the best compromise we feel is in this region right here, two or three. So for this talk, I'll be focusing on the tandem, but we also have work being done on the triple junction as well. And this is not a very bad compromise because if you look at the efficiency allowed, for a tandem, it's 43% on one sun without any concentration. And for three suns, uh, excuse me, for triple junction, it's 49%. Those are very good numbers. 
If we achieve half of that, it would be a game changer for us. So now, if you think about this, what technology should you choose to get to very high efficiencies? There are many technologies that exist to do that. Some of them are listed here. This is not like meant to be a complete list. There is multiple exciton generation, or, or MEG for short. Uh, hot carry extraction, that would be very useful, what we talked about before. Nanostructure materials, including the novel types of physics that occur at the nanoscale. Down conversion, impurity or multi-band PV, and multi-junction devices. Now, unfortunately, most, if not all, of these technologies are very far from production, let alone from commercialization. Most of these are five to 20 years away from commercialization, save for one, and that would be the multi-junction device. The multi-junction device is the most mature near-term technology of high efficiencies, and it is a, it is a technology of choice for near-term commercialization. For Stein, we decided to go with thin films rather than a wafer-based system, primarily because of these reasons. It's lower cost, you can scale it to large areas. You are not limited by the size of the bull that you can grow. So you can actually have a square meter or larger of the thin film multi-junction devices. No solar concentrations required. We, we don't want to do that because of the complexity. Therefore, this operation is very simple. And for thin films, the last matching is not anywhere near as critical. So there are a lot of very good reasons why we went to thin films multi-junction devices. What are there again? Multi-junction because it is the nearest term technology to high efficiency. Thin film because of all the reasons that we listed here. So for Stein, we're focusing on two and three junction devices, primarily because, again, the efficiency gains with higher order N do not justify the increase in cost and complexity and the decrease in reliability. So for the rest of the talk, I'll be talking about the tandem.